Condon from the Historical Society of Clarendon, and this month we're exploring the early history of railroading in the area. Uh, we've asked Matt Rockwell to come in and talk to us. Uh, he's been interested in the history of railroading for most of his life. Yeah. So, Matt. Good evening. I want to start off with the basic history of the Rutland Railroad, or as uh, it was originally chartered in 1843 as the Champlain and Connecticut River Railroad. In uh, November of 1847, it was renamed the Rutland and Burlington Railroad, and it was chartered to go between Burlington, Vermont, and Bellis Falls, Vermont, with the later interchange with the Canadian Railroads and Central Vermont at some point. Now, um, See, construction began in Burlington and Bellis Falls about the same time, May 1st, 1848. And, uh, see, completion of the line was in December 18th, 1849, with the final spike being driven in Summit, Vermont. And that was also the same day that the first passenger train rolled through Clarendon. And, uh, let's see, in 1852, the Western Vermont Railroad was organized and was later reorganized as the Bennington and Rutland on October 6th, 1865, and, uh, which later, after 1900, it became amalgamated into the Rutland Railroad, along with the Ogdensburg and Lake Champlain and the uh, Nolan and Rutland. Now, as to the stations in North Clarendon, uh, North Clarendon Depot was the first constructed, followed by East Clarendon. And then when the Bennington and Rutland came through, it was the Clarendon Flats Depot, which I believe was right out here. Right down back. Right down back. Yeah. There, and then the Cold River Depot, which was later renamed Alfresia, which was on Alfresia Road. However, the North Clarendon Depot and the Alfresia Depot are believed to have been flag stops only, which means that if a passenger wanted to get onto the train at uh, North Clarendon or at Alfresia, they'd have to put out a red flag on the side of the depot to let the engineers know to stop. And then they could purchase their tickets directly from the conductors. Are you going to touch on the Clarendon and Pittsford Road? Uh, the Clarendon and Pittsford actually, believe it or not, did not come into Clarendon. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> it was the Clarendon and Pittsford was basically part of the Vermont Marble Company. It was formed and operated by the Vermont Car Marble Company, which means all the employees were part of Vermont Marble. So, whenever the railroads went on strike, the Clarendon and Pittsford kept running because they were not a part of the Brotherhood. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so, where did it run from? It basically ran from Rutland, Center Rutland. West Rutland up through Proctor and up into Florence. They're basically serving the marble quarries of the that the Vermont Marble Company owned, as well as serving the finishing mills. Did they go to the Danby Quarry also? Uh, the Rutland pretty much handled the uh, marble coming out of Danby Quarry. Yeah. And uh, there is one spur track that comes off the Delaware and Hudson and came down into. Uh, Clarendon Springs, but I haven't found too much information as to which railroad served that section. So I'm assuming it's the Delaware and Hudson. And, uh, and the railroad, as it was being constructed, the uh, actually the local communities and the farmers especially were concerned about, you know, how soon they could get the railroad in because they saw it as a great way to move, uh, let's see, perishable items a lot quicker and as, as well as a means for them to get more <coughs> product to the public a lot faster, which means more income. And then of course, uh, it's also, it was a great way to get quick transportation, not only for goods, animals, and people up and down and across the Green Mountains, because that was a really tough and difficult task at the time. <laughs> especially by stagecoach, going over the rough roads, They're trying to get over the Green Mountains. Mm. Do you know 
know when the, you know, we still have the East Clarendon Station. When, yeah. what, what happened to the other stations? Uh, the other stations, I'm not sure if they fell into disrepair or if they had to be moved away from the railroads. I haven't found too much information in regards to what happened after they were closed up. When did, when did they close them up? Uh, it was around 1931, actually. They're, they're, I think they still continued to be um, flag stops after 31, but there were no more station agents. And then uh, the passenger service itself actually ended in 1953 after a strike aired in regards to um, wages. And, uh, Where was the, where was the stop in Alfreja? Uh, it was basically on the north end of the railroad crossing on Alfreja Road. Okay. Yeah. There was like a small, it was almost like the North Dorset Depot as far as size and floor plan. Yeah. And the uh, the Clarendon Flats Depot was also that design, wasn't it? Yes, uh, the Bennington and Rutland tended to keep with similar designs, there with the exception of the larger station stops. I believe we have pictures of those on our website. Yeah, we have yeah. all four stations, so stations. photos you know, on the one side in the, in the railroad collection. <laughs> and there is a Croft map showing the Alfreya station layout. Oh, cool. I have a couple of different things after we're done with the discussion. I have some sketches up here of various Rutland equipment. There I also have Rutland Railroad Company um, rule book for let's see, 1937. And then I have some annual reports from the Rutland from 1954 and 1956. And even though this is not a Rutland lantern here, I brought it along to show what a brakeman's lantern would look like. And then this is a marker light off of a passenger car, actually. As you can see, the... <coughs> then the hat is from the Rutland. This is an original early 1900s Rutland Railroad conductor's cap. It's seen better days, obviously. <laughs> you know, complete with hat badge. And I also have some photos from the Rutland also. Majority of the steam locomotives were sold for scrap. There, I think the only piece that actually survives is the cab off of Rutland switch engine number 100. Where would that be? Uh, that was in Bellis Falls at the Steamtown collection, but last I heard it had actually been moved over to Malone, New York to another museum. And Doesn't the Webb Estate have, have an engine and a coal car? Or yeah, that's from the central Vermont. <laughs> that's what? That's from the central Vermont. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, that was a competitor of the Rutland. They're along with one of the business cars, I believe the Grand Isle. Yeah. There was a time when the central Vermont also controlled the Rutland. Do you know, did that influence the service either from Rutland to Bellows Falls or Rutland to Bennington much in terms of that didn't seem to the route through Northfield. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that didn't seem to really hurt the passenger service much because people still needed wanted to go from, like say Rutland to Bellows Falls or Rutland to Ludlow. They'd still have to take the train over the Green Mountains through that, you know, along the route following 103. And uh, 
actually that did the Rutland a good bit of business or actually that helped them out considerably financially as well as in track repairs and maintenance. And of course after the Central Vermont had control of the Rutland, the New York Central then gained about 51% of the shares in gaining control. And then you started seeing more of the New York Central uh, design showing up in freight cars, <coughs> steam locomotives. <coughs> you saw more, of, like say, the ten window cupola cabooses, which was a New York Central design. Then after the New York Central, the New Haven actually regained the uh, majority of the shares after they released the Rutland. However, the Rutland still continued to maintain its New York Central heritage throughout. There's a couple of uh, old railroad stations been moved along Route 103. Yeah. Where did they come from, Clarendon? Uh, no, the one along 103 is actually the East Wallingford Station. Okay. There, that was all three of the Wallingford stations actually survived. There, there's South Wallingford depots over in Paulette. The original Wallingford depot is being used as the fire department now. And then the East Wallingford depot got moved over to 103. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the one that's farther along Road 103, was that the Healdville station? Yes. On the yeah. south side of 103? Yeah. It was the what station? Healdville. Healdville. We have a couple old photographs that purport to be from after the 1927 flood in yep. East Clarendon. One showing where the tracks just drooped right down <laughs> a steep embankment. Yep. But I recently acquired one that shows a lot of rail cars that got dumped down the embankment. Presumably, I'm guessing they were damaged during the flood uh, elsewhere. And they got they were dumped. brought up and used as part of the fill as to help part of strengthen the, fill, the that bank, and, and bank. You know, and it said, I forget yeah. how much, but an enormous yeah. amount of <laughs> gravel. But all these rail cars that were dumped and presumably buried there. And one of our mysteries is where exactly was that? Have you any idea? Uh, I believe it was just north of the East Clarendon station. Now, I have no actual proof of this, but I believe it was that long stretch just to the north end, okay. right? Because I have I have seen those actual photos. Yeah, yeah. so we've got them on our website yeah. now yeah. in the rail collection, and the one with the dumped rail cars. It's only been there a couple weeks. Yeah, you know, I just yeah. found it, uh, and it's rather amazing to think all of that is you know, buried there, and yeah. <laughs> people have never heard of it. Yeah, I imagine most of the wood has deteriorated as there were wood-sided cars, but I imagine a great portion of the steel is still there from the truss rods. The I'm not sure if they would have dumped the trucks in there, but or the couplers. I uh, think they I may have reused in those. In the picture, the actual yeah. wheels and axles yeah. and everything, which I was surprised. If that's the case, then the trucks are still with the cars. Yeah. yeah. Well, well it'd be good to find that spot someday. <laughs> I think I'm, I suspect because of the embankment that it was just uh, east of the suspended bridge. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, mm -hmm. what is it, the, the uh, Appalachian Trail or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Long Could trail. be in Long that area. Trail. Yeah. How many miles of track did each section crew have to maintain? I'm guessing it was around four, between 14 and 20 miles, but that's just an estimated guess. <coughs> yes. You said that your uh, lamp there, the large lamp, was. Yep. On the side of the car. I thought that was a switching lamp. That's what I no, thought. No, the uh, switching lamps have large targets on them that would actually come out even further like this. They have more of a squared off look. Here, this one, because of this, 
piece here. This is what goes into the side of the bracket on the, the uh, end corners of a passenger car or caboose. Or this one's a passenger lantern because Rutland caboose lanterns had yellow and red lenses instead of the red and green. Is that well, kerosene? I've got one or? of my great Yeah, it's kerosene. Yeah. And that's kerosene as well. The yes. Uh, but that <clears throat> it did, it had a fixture on the bottom to be a switching lamp. And it had the same size uh, Fresnel glass on it. Yeah, they used similar sizes and designs, but as I said, the target lamps had a large, like cone added around these here well, so that I'm even in the daylight they could see the colors on the cone portions during the daylight then at night time they could go by the regular lenses to know which way the switches are thrown I've seen those yeah yeah those are hard to come by well the one Better. that I have is the fixture on the bottom the mount yeah. on a pole yeah this one doesn't have the foot that goes underneath here yeah. for You mentioned the yeah. section of crews. Were there any section houses in Clarendon on either of the lines? Uh, I haven't seen, found any information on that yet. Um, I know there's a, one in East Wallingford and I believe farther down by Ludlow. Uh, being a 50 mile stretch, I imagine there was a few more. I know there was one in North Dorset, but between yeah. there and Rutland, I don't know. <clears throat> and there again, there might be another one in Wallingford. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in South Wallingford or Wallingford itself. Uh, so where were maintenance crews stationed as an example of track needed to repair here in Clarendon? Did they come out of Rutland? Yeah, they, there was a section house up by the uh, Howe Richardson Scale Company, or House Scale now. Mm -hmm. Uh, the track crews could have used, well, after the 1940s, the track crews actually had rail speeders, so they didn't have to use the pump cars anymore. And they could just get in and travel faster between sections. There, They could actually cover more territory after 1950. Yeah. Have you been to the one in East Wallingford, the section house? Uh, not yet, but I would like to get over there. I have the key yeah. to it. <laughs> <laughs> And there is a speeder car in there, you know. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the few. Yeah. Actually, do you know, I mean, you knew the sequence of the rail stations coming in. Do you know when those stations actually were built? Uh, not offhand. No. I'm just curious. Yeah. But I do know that the East Clarendon station, there were two stations there. Uh, one was looked like a squared off house, and then the one that you <coughs> see by 103 right now is the second version. Here. I actually have, well, courtesy of Mr. Rondononi here in the back here, he actually lent me this book for the night. And uh, in here it actually shows the first depot that was at East Clarendon. Is that our mystery spot? Yeah. Yeah. A picture we have of Clarendon and we can't mm -hmm. identify the station? It could very well be because there are two separate depots yeah. in that area. Might be. Because the deep you don't mind, I'd like to scan yeah. a photo out of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that may, yeah. you know, I, I have a little scanner out in my truck and, you know, can scan the photo. <laughs> that may help solve one of the questions we've had. Just I didn't know there were two. Yeah, I didn't know is, there were two stations. This is the first depot. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> On the same spot. Yeah. Same location. Yeah, same right location. The first one, you know? <clears throat> I'm not sure if it was destroyed by fire or if they just moved that one and that became another residence or I mean, it's hard to say sometimes what happens. Usually fire is the biggest cause for changing a depot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, they went with a more standard 16 by 40 foot uh, depot that the Rutland used primarily. Uh, when they first put the railroad in, you said 1843? Uh, it was chartered in 1843, but construction didn't start until 1848, now, 7, 1848. My question is, the first row, was it standard gauge or was it different? 
Uh, from everything I've read, it says standard gauge. Same you know, four feet, eight and a half inches. Okay. Yep. Uh, I think the only narrow gauge in Vermont was the West River Railroad that went from Brattleboro to South London Dairy. And then eventually in 1905, that <coughs> converted over to standard gauge by the uh, Central Vermont. When I was a kid in the early 50s, of course, the town garage wasn't down here. Yep. That was all swamp. Mm -hmm. And our barns just a little ways up yep. here. And I know on at least two or three occasions, the trains coming through would set that swamp on fire. <laughs> <laughs> My mother and us kids would be out there with brooms fighting, <laughs> fun, fighting the grass fire. The yep. only thing about the interior arrangement of the littler stations like the Clarendon Flats one, like would there be just a waiting room, a ticket office, well, the station master's office, the baggage room, or was there more to it than that? Oh. Uh, if it's anything like North Dorset, it would have been sectioned off into three parts. You would have had the station agent's area, which would have been in that triangular uh, alcove, <coughs> and then you would have had the baggage room and then the waiting room off to one side. Of course, being a small depot, the, they weren't expecting too much baggage. <laughs> Anybody, anybody ever recover any of the stoves that must have been in there? Uh, I imagine so. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I know every now and again a stove will turn up inside at like an antique dealer's or out of someone's personal collection. Uh, uh, I know we've seen some caboose uh, stoves show up here and there. Well, I yes, yep. um, the passenger cars versus the freight cars were they all part of the same uh, train or mm -hmm. or were they totally separate? Did they uh, utilize one engine to pull both passenger uh, cars and see. freight cars? Um, freight cars, the Rutland uh, mm -hmm. preferred to use, um, well, actually the Rutland used whatever they had for motive power yeah. available. <laughs> they, were, they were pretty much, the Rutland was uh, pretty much struggling for my, for like financial um, solidity throughout its entire career or existence. And so their steam locomotives, even in the 1950s, were pretty much leftovers that had been built around the early 1900s. So they actually used their steam locomotives longer than the majority of the railroads in the country because they were making them last. <coughs> it's like a frugal New England railroad. <laughs> I mean, in 1946, you were still seeing locomotives built around 1905, 1913, uh, and of course the only new locomotives they ever purchased were, like, in 1946 when they got four uh, Green Hornet class steam locomotives, or what they called the Green Hornets. They actually ordered four mountain class locomotives from Alco out of Schenectady, New York, and when they arrived, they were a dark green with yellow trim. So they really, of course, they didn't keep the paint color long because of the expense to keep them clean. <laughs> so, in like two years later, 1948, they painted them black. And sadly, those locomotives only lasted about seven years because in 1951, the diesels started showing up. And, uh, what was the typical life of a, of a steam engine? I mean, you're talking about being built in 1905, 1915, yeah. whatever, and still in use in 1940s. Yeah, and actually some of the 1913 locomotives lasted until 51 and 52, but the average lifespan, I believe, was 20 or 30 years. Or, or at least that's when, you know, most railroads tried to get as much use out of them. But you know, as I said, the Rutland actually held on to about a couple of mogul mm -hmm. steam locomotives that were built around 1885 and they didn't retire those till around 46. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the 144 and the 145. There, yeah, the 144 was the last uh, mogul steam locomotive the Rutland used. Yeah, and that was retired in July of 1946. And what would have been, what would have been Say the average distance that those things would have would have typically gone was it just local traffic? Um, 
mostly local traffic later on, but it wasn't uncommon to see them go from Rutland up through Aldberg and then across to Ogdensburg, New York. And, uh, yeah. And then they also used them on the Bennington branch going down to Chatham, New York. Yeah. Yeah, I bet you it's some nice, you could learn some interesting cursing with those. Yeah. <laughs> Now, on those distances that you just uh, explained, yeah. did they have to replenish the coal supply? Yeah, they would and have to how keep does, How did that work? Uh, was it like you just stopped where you needed to and just bought a load of coal? Or? Well, they usually had uh, water towers and coal towers at select locations. Like, say, Rutland was a primary hub, so you had like a huge 50,000 gallon water tank sitting there in the city, you know, right there by the turntable and roundhouse. And then you had a huge coaling tower that could actually service four locomotives at a time. And, uh, and then up in Burlington, again, you'd have like another coaling tower. And in between <coughs> Burlington and Rutland, you could see water towers in like Lester Junction, Brandon, Pittsburgh. Well, actually, Proctor had a really unique water tower there right along the Rutland Main Line. The base of the water tower was actually the cliff right beside the railroad, and then the cylindrical tower was built on top of the cliffside right there by the tracks. I don't know if there's any footprint left of that water tower, but. Uh, I have seen photos of it in uh, Nimke's 60 Years of Trying, Volume 5, Part 1. Yeah. I think Brandon had a coal uh, building up there, too. Yeah, I believe that was for the, uh, to distribute amongst the, it's almost <laughs> like Crosby's and Danby, but it's their own coal tower set. You know, they could provide a lot of the local families with coal for coal burning wood stove or coal burning stoves. This is kind of far out of your territory, but I was wondering about the Bennington station. As I read, Bennington didn't have most of the freight and passenger traffic south of here because it mostly went through North Bennington and off into yeah, New York. Off into but the Bennington Boston station Maine. is a pretty big fancy thing. Any idea why they made such a big station in a town that didn't have that much service? A statement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have all these masons, you know, put them to work and build something grand. Uh, when the railroads were first being built, they wanted them to be lavish. They wanted to say, we have this, we can do this, so, you know, this is the kind of money we can generate. Yes. Yeah. It's And of course, being in this area, the railroads ended up in financial difficulty because of that. I guess I, yeah. uh, Clarendon Springs, um, there's a quarry there and then yes. a hotel. Yeah. Do, you, do you know if the tracks ever, they went to the quarry, I assume? Yeah, I believe it. I have found a track, uh, well, a uh, topographical map with a line running from the Delaware and Hudson down into that area. I was wondering if there's any record of that line carrying guests to and from the Clarendon Springs Hotel. <coughs> well, unfortunately, that section of track I have not been able to find anything on so far other than the map. There, I'm assuming it was served by Delaware and Hudson ever since it comes off their main line. But I'm not certain if they actually brought passengers in or if that was done by stagecoats or only from West Rutland. Or yeah, so we, we have yeah. some references to people with, you know, horse and buggy basically picking up guests in West Rutland. So the, they may take trains to West Rutland and, yeah. you know, then get ferried up to Clarendon Springs. Okay. This isn't a question, but my mother grew up here in the flats, and she talk, used to talk about how the hobos would get off the train <laughs> and go to her mother's house because they always knew they could get food there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did, they did, they did, they did, they did. Yeah. 
and they had some way, some sign that they would mark that would tip yeah. off the other hobos that yours were. So that they know that that was friendly to the yeah. hobo culture. Right. <laughs> the hobos had a whole variety of drawings or signs yeah. to warn people or encourage them. Didn't yeah, they? I believe the one to encourage them to stop was a cat, I believe, drawn like a round body head with the pointed ears and then a tail to indicate that there was a nice lady living there. For, uh, uh, so. Of course it could be anything from being scratched onto a stone or like etched into a fence or a tree somewhere so that they would know. And, uh, and when did the first line actually come through here? Around 1852 on this side. Through. <coughs> You know about yeah. the other side, East Clarendon? Uh, the other side was 1849. Like great grandfather's diary mentions that. On, yeah. It's an 1849 diary. Yeah. And there's just a statement in there that says, <laughs> We heard the cars today for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Were the railroads running mostly on making their what money they made? Were they making it on freight or on passenger? Uh, it was mostly freight. Yeah, we shipped cheese to Boston back in the 1800s. Yeah. I sold through this mm -hmm. station. Well, I was told that farmers used it a lot with the old yeah, milk Yeah, especially cans. with the milk. Oh, yeah. Milk was the primary money maker on the Rutland, actually. You know, start off with his uh, milk train 7 and 8 from Ogdensburg, New York, over to Alberg, Vermont. And then in Alberg, Vermont, it would switch over to tra milk train 87 and 88 down to Chatham, New York, and in Rutland it would actually split off and then you'd have, uh, I believe, so 160, uh, 164 and 165 was actually the Green Mountain Flyer. I'd, I'd have to go back and check on the numbers, but there was a milk train that went up over through North Clarendon and East Clarendon as well, <coughs> going to Boston, whereas the main milk train would go to New York City it would actually connect with the New York Central in Chatham, New York. <coughs> when did refrigerated cars come in? Let's see, I believe around 1854 on the Ogdensburg branch when they started using ice in uh, box cars. Yeah. Very cool. Now, is there a, a, I mean, I know the locomotives often had names. You know, uh, besides just a number, yeah. you know, they had names. Is there a repository someplace of, you know, the names of these locomotives and photos or anything? Uh, the best source actually is the Rutland Historical Society. They actually have the list of the first Rutland, you know, like the Rutland and Burlington locomotives, like the Timothy Foley, uh, let's see, the Mosalamu, number 16. Uh, the second number 16, which was the Rockingham, I know those firsthand. Uh, All right, no, good. I'll look uh, there. I only yeah, asked, they, I just came across, you know, a few days ago, an yeah. article, you know, someone in town here who was uh, hit and killed uh, by a train in 1866, yeah. and it named, uh, you know, the, the engine. Yeah. <laughs> the one that hit him, you know, in the article. Yeah. Uh, but, and I uh, thought that would be kind of neat if I could find a photo, you know, of it. Well, Jim Shaughnessy's done. book on the Rutland Road. Yeah, that covers a lot of it. That. Yeah. And James Shaughnessy, published in what, 1960 something? Yeah, originally. Yeah. yeah that's Called a, Rutland Road? Yeah, you see yeah. the Rutland Railroad or mm -hmm. the Rutland Road? The yeah, Rutland Road. Mm -hmm. see if I He's got an awful lot of photographs in there of yeah. different engines. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Shaughnessy actually passed away not too long ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In this case, they were unclear whether the train was moving faster than the gentleman thought, or the gentleman was moving slower <laughs> than the gentleman thought, but it, it didn't end well. <laughs> yes, but well I'm following up on that accident yeah. thing, uh, the North Dorset Cemetery has one gravestone that refers to somebody being killed on the cars, which I understand means yeah, that was killed so in a railroad accident. Are there any graves like that in Clarendon, I wonder, the folks who 
died railroad accidents if they say killed on the cars? Not that I know of. Never seen what's, what's the question? Uh, killed on the cars back in the 1840s and 50s meant yeah, killed yeah. in a railroad accident. And there's yeah, a the train cemetery cars. in North Dorset that has yeah. a grave that says killed on the cars. I'm just wondering like that, whether somebody? Clarendon has any no. cemeteries with stones like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, train cars back during you know, before you see the knuckle couplers that we have today, they actually had what was called Lincoln pin couplers. You actually had this huge wrought iron link that would be in an oval. And in order to couple the cars together, someone had to stand between the cars holding this pin into the coupler pockets. And as the cars came together, they would drop these pins down in through holes on the cars to keep the pins and, you know, the links together so that they could actually pull the trains. And I actually lost three ancestors that way. They were working as brakemen, doing this very dangerous position, and they'd get crushed between the cars. Mm -hmm. It was a very dangerous profession. Yeah. Yeah. Well, setting brakes in winter before air brakes, that was yeah, pretty that dangerous, was pretty too, dangerous wasn't it? too, going from rooftop to rooftop in the middle of winter when you got all this ice on the roofs to turn these brake wheels on tops of the cars. It was easy to slide off. And yeah. When did uh, the caboose go out of fashion? Uh, that actually, I believe, what, early 80s, Paul? Well, more towards the middle of late. Middle, middle of late 80s. Than others. Yeah. There's that's, still a few around mm -hmm. in use. Yeah. That's, it was around that time when they started switching to a flashing end of train device. Yeah. I tend to remember <coughs> that. In my earliest days, they, were, they would actually carry part of the crew. Then they were empty, but just on the back. Yeah. And then they disappeared. It was basically a conductor's cab or office that, so that they could keep paperwork. And of course, now conductors ride in the cabs of the locomotives as they only need about two man crews now. I grew up in Bellows Falls and big old Victorian and up on the third floor I could look out, look across the Connecticut River and towards the rail yards. Yeah. I can remember as a little kid sitting there watching the freight trains <laughs> going by. I mean, there was, you know, typically 100, 110 cars, you know, yeah. sitting there. Two engines, <laughs> one way or the other. I had a good friend who worked in the rail yard down there, used to ride the switcher all the time. <laughs> When he was supposed to be at catechism. <laughs> 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 Were there a lot of accidents, like, you know, derailing and things like that in the early days, or has it always yeah, that was, kind of been? That was a common problem back then. Uh, some, of course, you had different people manufacturing rails, and the iron wasn't always, you know, the same quality. I mean, and then... Like out west, I don't know if they did this here in the east coast, but out west, in order to speed up construction, they would actually make the rails out of wood and then put a piece of strap wrought iron down onto the wood. And of course, out in the sun, in like the Midwest or even in the desert, the sun would heat up the metal, the metal would start pulling away from the wood, and then you'd get what's called a snakehead, where the uh, piece of iron would actually peel up like this and that would literally rip the wooden train cars apart as they go across it. And there's actually a lot of derailments mentioned there where there was actually a lot of fatalities because of that. There's a piece like that that pops up right over there on West Street by the food center. <laughs> <laughs> Rails must have been, you know, a large industry. Oh, yeah, Back that, in the early, where did the majority of the rails come from? Oh, let's see. Some of the first rails that the Rutland received, believe it or not, actually came from England. <laughs> it was shipped into Boston, and then from Boston it was taken to Bellis Falls, and they started from that way. On this side, there was actually a car, train car manufacturer up in Brandon, and they also dabbled with making rails to help out, you know, from... Brandon to Rutland, and then Burlington got a shipment of rails. I'm not sure from what destination, but uh, and then of course Carnegie got into rail production as well as other steel and 
So then you started seeing Bessemer and you know a lot of other ironworks uh, popping up all out throughout Pennsylvania and New York. And so it was pretty much get your rails from wherever you can. <laughs> And the history yeah. of just laying the rails must be interesting in that they yeah. probably just camped along the way yeah. as they built. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, I have a record in Mollyford of them um, right where our uh, transfer station is, is where they have, <laughs> they called it, I forget what the exact wording, like Irish Shantyville or something they called it. Yeah, they're like usually that. called Shantyvilles. And, yeah. uh, but did they move as they built, or did they I go wondered, back to a base? I wondered if they were based in all. Yeah, they'd go a, a certain amount of miles per day, and then go you know go back, and then as they got beyond what they could easily travel, they would then move the Shantyville on to the next location. There, and they'd usually go well ahead of the railroad, so they'd have to actually use wagons and. Uh, like say oxen and whatnot to pull wagon loads of materials that they need to set up the next shantyville and then start over again. And there were and probably people <coughs> cooking in camp versus yeah. being out in the field and then they'd come back yeah. they all mm -hmm. have a different job. Or in some cases they would actually have a specific train car made up to act as a moving kitchen there as well as possible bunkhouses also uh, later on. The first passenger trains, the restroom, <laughs> <laughs> it just dumped on the tracks, didn't it? it uh, right off to the side, yes. That's why on some old passenger cars you'll see a little metal plaque on the side that says, don't flush while in station. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and they also like for the passenger cars in you know, winter time. They had like was it coal burning stoves. Yes, coal burning stoves. You know, for heat, kerosene lamps for light, and that worked fine as long as you didn't. As have long as you didn't tip over. Because <laughs> then that would tip and yeah, it was you know, a lot of a lot of derailment fires back during the 1800s actually <coughs> occurred because of lamps and coal burning stoves falling over and the hot coals going all over the wood floors, the wood sidings. Yeah, it's basically a tinder box at that point. Mm -hmm. Any idea the price of, of a box car or a uh, a passenger car of varying sizes? Um, yeah. About the only one, brandy new kind of thing. Well, um, the two foot narrow gauge Sandy River and Rangeley Lakes actually spent twenty thousand dollars on one passenger car back in, I believe, nineteen ten. <laughs> so imagine what that price would be today, yeah. and that's just for one where the rails are two feet apart. Yeah. Right. So you're talking a six foot four inch wide train car, about uh, seven feet tall, roughly. Is that like the, yeah. the president's personal car? Though? Yes, that would be a very lavish part of the car. In the early days of train travel, the passenger side, was it at a level that you know anyone could buy a train ticket, or was it really just kind of the professional class um, that could afford it? Originally, just the upper class and uh, possibly the upper middle class because a lot of the furnishings inside the first cars were actually like say crushed velvet covered seats and it was very luxurious. Uh, That's why there were so many hobos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered that too because um, this woman that lived in Wallingford, she was wonderful and she had, she was in her 90s was telling me stories of how she took the train to high school from <laughs> Cuttingsville to Rutland. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, of course, in some areas, like out in Alaska, they actually do uh, send children to school on, like, uh, let's see, RDCs or rail deal diesel cars. There, in order because they can't get easy access through uh, the road systems and. Uh, <coughs> So they actually do send, like say, British Columbia, Alaska, they actually send the kids to school by train. Mm -hmm. 
Of course, they have specific passes to do so. <laughs> when my mother used to, and some of her friends used to go from Bellows Falls to Framingham, Mass, to go shopping. <laughs> They'd go down in the morning on the train mm -hmm. and come back in the evening on the train. I used to go to Boston every year to do shopping with my mother on the train in New Hampshire. Now, did the local stations have, were they porters? And they'd come on and they'd have those big coffee pots mm -hmm. and do food and coffee. Did they have that locally uh, or was that just let's see, I know. I know they had a setup in, at the Rutland station, there, the large brick station they used to have downtown. They actually had a counter. You, know, you could get off the trains, go to the counter, they'd have the huge coffee cylinders and provide food. And let's see, on board train, I believe the porters actually stayed on the trains with the cars, you know, for dining cars. And uh, of course, um, most of the dining cars that came through here were from New York Central or Boston and Maine. In the passenger trains, were there ever routinely cars that were neither Rutland nor Boston and Maine nor New York Central that would be running through here? Uh, I've actually been trying to research this because I'm curious as to whether or not Boston and Albany and New Haven actually had cars go through here. I haven't found anything yet, but uh, due to the close connections, it wouldn't surprise me if every now and again you'd see uh, Boston and Albany because they connected with the Rutland and Chatham. And then the New Haven would have equipment running up through the Connecticut River with the Boston and Maine and Central Vermont lines. And so I'm curious as to whether or not New Haven cars would actually make their way up on the Green Mountain Flyer. Or I haven't seen any photos yet, but it would be interesting to find out. And were the rails a right-of-way or owned in fee, the land for the rails? Uh, the railroads actually bought land from the farmers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the families along, you know, up and down through because, I mean, back then the families saw it as a golden opportunity, as again, to move goods and products a lot quicker and in larger quantities. So there was little resistance. Yeah. <laughs> I asked about the cabooses. Now, yeah. on the front of the train, when did the cow catchers disappear? <laughs> did that oh. disappear when they went from steam to diesel? Pretty much steam to diesel because it was a federal regulation to have the cow catchers on here, <clears throat> on the front of the locomotives, mainly to help protect livestock or, well, I don't know how well you could protect livestock <laughs> with the way that you have been, but, you know, over in England, you don't have to have cow catchers because they have fences lining the entire right-of-way. Here, it's a lot of open land, so, I mean, no one's going to want to fence in the entire lines because that gets expensive. Uh, so as uh, added security measures so to avoid derailments, cow catchers were made mandatory. So what was the rationale to get rid of them? Uh, I mean, cows <laughs> are the same. Today yeah. <laughs> as they were. Uh, I guess more <laughs> functionality than anything they would, I mean, um, like say, for example, the Rutland RS3s and RS1 diesel locomotives, they still had snow cutter plows, which were these little triangular points there underneath the couplers, but that was primarily for basic snow removal. And, I guess it's one of those features that went by the wayside. Yeah. Or maybe farmers got smarter. You know, if time went on, there were less cows too. That's <laughs> you know, if there was ever a time when the rails stopped for some disaster, you know, in the area like flooding well, or the, the 1927 and 1947 floods were key issues. Um, I know milk train number 88 or 87 was stranded in Proctor behind steam locomotive number 81. There, of course, the water actually went right up just beneath the uh, top of the cab. The engineer and fireman actually climbed up on top of the cab and had to wait there to be rescued. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of damage was done from the 1927 flood. And, and what was the time period to get all that? 
basically back together uh, a week, a month? Uh, oh, months. <laughs> well, depending on. Well, <laughs> yeah, actually, the Rutland did reasonably well getting their trackage back together. The uh, Canadian National came in and helped out the Central Vermont, and then, you know, because of the amount of time and effort put into it and the amount of money the Canadian National put into it, they actually absorbed the Central Vermont and made it a part of their uh, umbrella. But the Rutland managed to stay separate, and uh, within probably about a month or two, they had the lines back up and running. Working for the railroad, was it considered a good job? You had a good job? Uh, it was reasonable. I wouldn't say it was the best paying job because the Rutland did have several different strikes over the years from the 1920s on up through into the 50s and then the final strike in 1960. So there was a time when rail service actually came to a stop here on the western side of Vermont because the Rutland actually filed for abandonment and was granted abandonment in 1963. So between 1963 and 1964, when Vermont Railway was started by, I believe, Henry Wolfson, there, we actually went a year on this side of the state without rail traffic. And uh, unfortunately, because of that, we went to more, a lot of the local businesses started going to tractor trailers and never returned to the rails. At some point, the state of Vermont bought the ownership of all the lot, you know. All yeah, the they lot. bought all the trackage that the Rutland had in Vermont. The uh, New York trackage pretty much was torn up and stayed that way, with the exception of a small section from Ogdensburg to Norwood, New York. So that small section of the Rutland still survives over there. As well, it was a separate entity for a while, but Vermont Rail Service has since gain control of that part of the Brooklyn also. And do you know why the state of Vermont bought? Uh, in hopes that they could keep the trackage together so that the, if someone did come along that could start rail service again on the western portion of Vermont, uh, they could lease the trackage to that person and get rail traffic going a lot quicker. So basically, right now, Vermont Rail Service is leasing the uh, rails up through here, up between Burlington and Bennington. Now they're going, of course, the Bennington line branch from North Bennington to Bennington is pretty much weed covered right now because they're interchanging with the Pan Am over in uh, Hoosick Falls, New York, or at Hoosick Junction. And, and then, of course, uh, Nelson Blunt and Steamtown actually saved the 50-mile uh, Bellis Falls branch there by starting up Steamtown USA in Riverside and uh, then forming the Green Mountain Rail Corporation not long after to keep freight service going on that end. The tracks right now seem fairly heavily used. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's a big, big amount of business there. Any other questions? I was going to ask, um, yeah. with regards to the Rutland uh, Historical Society having the names of the locomotives and things yeah. of that nature, I'd be interested if uh, there's information on like station masters over the years that manned the Clarendon Flats or. Mm -hmm. East Rutland, because we do have a couple of pictures of yeah. some people standing out in front of them. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, for here we have uh, the name of you know one of the station masters of this photo, and I think we have a picture from you, Ed, about the crew uh, East you know, over in East Clarendon, you know, with their names, you know, maintenance crew. Yeah, that would be interesting to find out because uh, the Rutland Historical Society actually took in a lot of information as well as several artifacts. There, Mike Barberi can uh, agree with me on that one there due to the headlights, bells. Uh, they actually lent us, uh, well, the Rutland Railway Association and Rutland Railroad Museum, the headlight off of one of the mountain class steam locomotives, number 91. 
So we are currently have that on display at our depot on loan from the Historical Society. When I was a kid uh, growing up over in New York, uh, the D&H went by and yeah. one of the favorite fun things to do as a kid <laughs> is as the train is going by to yell mm -hmm. to the engineer, mm -hmm. chalk, and they would always <laughs> throw you those oh. big cigar-sized pieces of chalk <laughs> that they use, I guess, on the boxcars or something. But it was always a treat to get a big chunk of chalk from the engineer. Yeah, was, um, sometimes... Cyrus, Christmas is coming, yeah. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's why today yeah. I don't expect much. Yeah, if, um, chalk. Like back in the day, especially the steam era, when you had the wood-sided boxcars, you'd always have issues or problems like say if something like a journal box was bad or like if there was some other issue with the box car, the engineer or the uh, brakeman could actually write on the car what needs to be repaired and when this issue was designated, you know, they'd date it and that way there when they put the, took the train cars to the shops, the shop crew would know where the problem was and they could address it that way. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>